We are in Mark chapter 2. If you're joining us for the first time or new to Coastline, we really make it our aim on Sundays to walk through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we're in a series through the Gospel of Mark. And this morning, we'll be in the first 12 verses of chapter 2. So for this morning, I'm going to be reading and teaching from the New King James Version. And as I read the text, we will have it on the screen, but encourage you to, to have a Bible as will be elsewhere in God's Word this morning. So I'll read the text, we'll pray, and then we'll spend some time learning from God's Word so that we can live for God by His Word this week. Let's read. Verse 1 of chapter 2. And again he entered Capernaum. After some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Pop quiz, who is he and he in this, in this verse? Jesus. Jesus, you got it, okay. Immediately, many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. When they could not enter near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. And so he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, arise. Take up your bed and walk. Look at verse 10. Big verse for this section this morning. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Amen. And there had to be some tension in that moment. Verse 12, immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Father, as the word of God is open this morning, Lord, I ask in all humility, simplicity, that our hearts would be open to the voice of your spirit through your word. God, that you would speak to us. Lord, yes, that you would instruct us in more things about you, but Lord, even more importantly, that we would know you more deeply and intimately through the word of God this morning. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have a seat. You know, throughout the gospel account of the life of Jesus, Mark is very interesting. Mark seeks to, to jolt his readers into an understanding of who Jesus is. And he moves very, very quickly through the life and the ministry of Jesus throughout this gospel. He begins in verse 1. If you want to turn back there with me and look at chapter 1, verse 1, I'd like to give you just a little bit of a sense of what's happening in chapter 2 by fully understanding what's happening in chapter 1. He begins with an announcement, straight to the point of who Jesus is. Verse 1, he says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. You know, packed into this very first verse, Mark proclaims, let me say that again, he proclaims three powerful truths that he unpacks throughout this gospel. The first is this that this is the good news about Jesus. Now, we translate that word good news as gospel. Originally, the New Testament was written in a language called Aramaic Greek, Koine Greek, also in Aramaic and other places. And the word that is used in the original Greek language is evangelion. You say, okay, why do you say that? Why do you share that? Well, the word was often used, that word evangelion, 
That word was kind of only used for making proclamations about ones like the emperor, those of royalty, the ruler. So as Mark is opening up this gospel and saying, there's an evangelion about Jesus, this language, it's intended to startle, to jolt, to awaken those in the first century and us to this reality. Jesus is royalty. Jesus is king. He's not anything less. Now, the Bible, we know, gives us an even fuller explanation and understanding of the reality that Jesus is king. We just went through the book of Revelation together earlier this year and all of last year. Revelation 19 tells us that the full title of Jesus is that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Mark, as he opens up this gospel, he doesn't just give us a description about Jesus, but a declaration. Here is Jesus, the, the evangelion, the good news about him. He is royalty. He is king. He is king of kings. And this king of kings, he says in verse 1, he is Messiah, the anointed one. You see, the Jews had been long awaiting the arrival of Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one. One who was promised by God that like a prophet like Moses would speak on behalf of God powerfully. One who would come from a royal lineage, the royal lineage, the lineage of King David. And as Messiah, he would establish a kingdom that would last forever. He would see to it that God's enemies would be defeated. I mean, set yourself in the sandals of the first century. Mark opens up this gospel. Here's the evangelion, the good news, the royal announcement about Jesus. He is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. And third, he's the son of God. Now, in our culture, we don't live in the first, but the 21st century. Often this can be a term, a description of Jesus that can be easily misunderstood. Like when you say the son of God, what do you mean? Like the offspring of God or somehow like God? I love how Pastor David Guzik explains this. He says this, some people think that when Jesus is called the son of God, it's a way of saying that he's not God, but something less. But in those days, and remember with me, church, to best understand the Bible, you must understand to whom it was originally written. That first century mindset, when they heard this phrase, son of God, here's what they thought. Here's what they understood it to be. In those days, to be called son of something meant you were totally identified with that thing or person. Their identity was your identity. And when Jesus called himself the son of God, and when others called him that, it was understood as a clear claim to his deity. Mark 1, verse 1, Mark comes out, guns a blazing. Here's the royal announcement about Jesus. He's the Messiah, the one that's been promised. He is the Son of God. And in verse 15, you see the heartbeat of Jesus' message throughout the Gospels. Look at verse 15 of chapter 1. He says, The time is promised by God, it's come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. See, the central message that Jesus preached throughout the Gospels is that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is now. Set yourself in those sandals. They have been awaiting this for centuries read the prophets, knowing that God would send this Messiah. And Jesus comes on the scene preaching this powerful, explosive message that the time that's been promised, it's here. Amen. The kingdom of God is near. So repent of your sins and believe the good news. See, the people were awaiting that king who would come from David, that, that ruler who would bring everlasting peace. And now Jesus says that time is now. 
Now, if you're sitting in the 21st century, which if you don't know and you're, you're already asleep, you, you are, you're sitting in the 21st century right now, you may say, what does that mean? Because I, I read the Old Testament prophecies about Messiah, and there would be this lion laying with the lamb, and you'd see this, this sense where all things are made right, but I also know that I live in a world where that's not the case. What does this mean? I love how the Life Application Bible Notes just brings a little bit of clarity to this. The author says, the kingdom of God began when God entered history as a human being. But the kingdom of God will not be fully realized until all evil in the world has been judged and removed. What book of the Bible do we see that in, church? Yeah, it kind of rhymes with Revelation. Does anyone know? Revelation. Yeah, we see that, right? Christ came to earth first as a suffering servant. He will come again as king and judge to rule victoriously over all the earth. And this is the point I wanted you to see. The kingdom of God was as near as people's willingness to make Jesus king over their lives. That's why, that's how the kingdom of God is here now. Because of who Jesus is, his arrival into history, what he's done on the cross, defeating death, rising again, giving us his spirit, we enter into this whole new kingdom. We're right here and now. He can rule and reign personally over your life. Amen. The kingdom of God is here. So come to him, Jesus would say. Repent. Believe the good news. You know, one author says this dynamic of believing in Jesus. I love how he puts it. He says this. This is not an appeal only to accept this intellectually as an accurate statement, but to rest in it, to repose in it. It was a call to let the heart find its ease in Jesus. Believe in him and what he's done. And so far in chapter one, we have seen nothing, nothing, but the undeniable authority of this one who is royal, this one who's the Messiah, this one who's the Son of God. I mean, in chapter 1, Mark writes about how the Old Testament prophets and this, this wild forerunner known as John the Baptist, even how the Father and the Spirit at the baptism by John the Baptist, that Jesus is affirmed. Jesus is validated, pronounced, declared, certified to be the one whom this royal announcement is made that he's Messiah and God. At the baptism on Pensacola Beach on Easter sunrise, Lord willing, it'll be a beautiful service. One year we did have sleet. We're praying against sleet in Jesus' name this year. But it's a beautiful service, seeing dozens upon dozens making profession that Jesus is Lord, making a declaration that they belong to Jesus. And I've had the opportunity to be at many of those baptisms. But I'll say this, I have never heard an audible voice from heaven at a baptism that affirms the sonship of someone at a baptism. So I've never seen the Spirit of God descend like a dove. This was a tremendous affirmation of who Jesus is. As you read through chapter one, Jesus' undeniable authority, it's there. It's attested to, validated, affirmed by this forerunner named John the Baptist, by this baptismal service where Jesus goes down and you see this magnificent declaration of who he is. And then think of what happens next. He goes into the wilderness to be tested by the enemy. He comes out victorious. He calls his first disciples. He starts to cast out demons, heals many, many people, shows up to Peter's mother-in-law's house, and it says in verse 34 of chapter 1 that he healed many people who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons. Last week we learned that he encounters a leper, a leper. Nobody hangs with lepers in the first century. And Jesus touches this leper, and he's healed completely. Chapter 1, nothing, nothing but the undeniable authority of who Jesus is. It is so easy in the 21st century to try and put Jesus on par with just every other religious leader and, and try and get them to spar amongst one another. Well, who's really... Man, if, if you read the Bible with an open heart, 
If you understand what's actually being said, Jesus is this, this one whom a royal announcement is made. He's Messiah. He is the Son of God. So much is, is, is surrounding the dynamics of Jesus' life and ministry. As chapter 1 kind of closes near there, verse 45, it says that large crowds soon surrounded Jesus. He couldn't publicly even enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in secluded places. But people from everywhere just kept coming. Now in chapter 2, where we are this morning, going, wow, I'm glad we finally got there. Well, I want you to understand the undeniable authority of Jesus. We're going to see conflict arise in the life of Jesus. In fact, chapters 2 and 3, there's five instances in which Mark highlights the conflict that come between Jesus and the religious leaders of that day. So look at verses 1 and 2 with me again in Mark chapter 2. We see this, that he again, speaking of Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Now remember, the setting is the first century in the Middle East. Rome is the dominant power at this time. And relatively, the world is living kind of as a whole in a time of unprecedented peace. If you know a little bit about history, this time period would be known as the Pax Romana. It's a time unlike others. And the city of Capernaum that's mentioned here, it's a, it's a city that's located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was the home of those brothers, Peter and Andrew. It's where Jesus met and called Matthew, the tax collector, to follow him. And Capernaum became kind of the home base of Jesus's ministry after he was driven out of Nazareth by those religious officials. It's a fishing community. Maybe, maybe 1,500 people in population. And you can kind of picture many in that city, brothers, cousins, business partners, daily going on to their boats and casting their nets to sell their catch at market. There's also a synagogue in Capernaum. So as you read through these chapters, you see these religious leaders popping up. Do they just have a thing for trout? Or like, what? no, 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 there's a synagogue there. So that area is kind of this mixture of those constantly going out, making their living off the land, and also the religious leaders there. And Jesus is back in this fishing community, kind of a, a hub for commerce. People begin to hear that he's in town. Now remember, in the first century, there's no electricity as the sun comes up, the sun goes down, it, it kind of sets the parameters of your day. It's not similar to our culture and the kind of entertainment or information or comforts that we have at our fingertips. I mean, if you want to catch up on what's happening, maybe connect with someone, you can grab a device, a cup of coffee from your home and stay connected and informed maybe as much as you want. Not in that day. Jesus is in town. They, they heard about the leper. They, they're crowding to wherever he is. And Mark seems to give us this indication that it's packed. Now, for me, when I think of crowds, when I think of something being packed, Pensacola Beach at the uh, Blue Angel Air Show, right? How many locals, like, love that weekend? Like, you're there every single... Yeah, there's some that just, I'm there. How many go, okay, I can watch it from my front yard. I'm going to watch it from right there. There's some of those. Well, for us, when we think of crowds, we may think of something like that. But the longest span excavated of homes during this time, according to some archaeological finds, is about 18 feet. So the capacity of an average home, if you're saying, man, it's wall to wall here, it's, it's Blue Angel Weekend in Capernaum, 50 people, maybe like this section of people right here are fitting into that house, wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder, out the threshold of the door. And there has to be, amongst this first century crowd, a tremendous amount of anticipation, almost adventurous sensation, right? Like, what's going to happen? Did you hear about his baptism? The voice from heaven, the spirit of God coming down. Another, did you hear about the wilderness? He had a sparring match with Satan. Angels and, and wild beasts were out there. I hear he's casting out demons. People that have been sick since birth are coming to Jesus and being healed at his very word. 
There's even a story that he touched a leper, and the leprosy was gone. Look, there's Pete's mother-in-law. She was sick with fever, possibly even unto death, and Jesus touches her and heals her, and there she is doing what she's always done, making sure every guest has everything they need, everything in its place and a place for everything. I wonder what will happen tonight. That's got to be the sense of the room. What work, what miracle, what, 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 what spectacle is Jesus going to perform? And what does the end of verse 2 tell us? Look there in your Bibles. He preached the word to them. Church, this is something to take note of. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. That's his primary purpose. But during his earthly ministry, before the cross, what was his focus? Was it the miraculous? Was it signs and wonders? You know, one pastor put it this way, Jesus was not a miracle worker who occasionally preached, but a preacher who occasionally healed. I love what one author says. He says, it's clear that he was avoiding the streets because they had turned into kind of a healing campaign. Everywhere he went, besieged, people besieged him with requests for healing and casting out demons so that he was unable to do what had, he had come to do primarily, which was to preach the word. Jesus is there in this house doing what he was called to do, show people who God is. That's why Jesus came to earth. Yes, to die, to take our death so that we could live his life most definitely. But during his earthly ministry, he was teaching the people, showing the people who God was with flesh on. Does that make sense? He, he was there to communicate to them God's love, his heart, his desire for a relationship with them. He's unpacking the truths of the Old Testament scriptures. And the setting with a wall-to-wall -wall crowd, as Jesus is teaching and people are listening, verse 3, they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So these five guys show up to the house. One of them can't walk. He's a paralytic. And we don't know much about these five guys. They didn't start a burger joint. We do know that much. Or how they're connected. You know, are they co-workers? Maybe. I mean, maybe not. I mean, if one's a paralytic, how, how could that work maybe in a work setting? Maybe it's a mixture of like family, you know, maybe brothers and cousins. We'll call these cousins or brothers or co-workers, whatever they are. We'll call them Gus, Willie, Bobby, and Rufus, right? Like here's the four. Maybe it's this mixture of family. Maybe grandma said, hey, Gus, Willie, Bobby, Rufus. I hear there's a miracle worker in town. Why don't you take your, uh, your cousin Matt to go see him? I don't know. But what we do know is that these four companions are taking this man to Jesus to be healed. Now, I know I'm belaboring this, but remember, the culture here is the first century. See, I know we've heard that. But it's also got a Jewish context of first century theology to this setting. Why is that important? To be paralyzed in any day is a tremendous struggle. To get around, to work, to have a family. A challenge, if not an impossibility, for sure. But in that culture, in that Jewish first century context, it was widely held, even by this one rabbi named Rabbi Ami, that suffering was always due to sin. Rabbi Ami said this, there's no death without sin and there's no suffering without iniquity. No suffering without iniquity. Whose iniquity? See, one of the greatest challenges of the Jewish religious mindset at that time is that it would often be influenced by sources outside of Scripture. Remember, Jesus is kind of dealing with that all throughout the Gospels, that these men would lay heavy burdens on people that God never did. And often they would reference things that nowadays you hear of the Mishnah and the Talmud. You say, what are those commentaries on the Bible that some will put at the same level of the Bible? And some believe during this time in the pre-existence of souls and that those souls could actually sin, that a, that a baby might be able to sin in the womb. And so if you had like a paralysis of that nature, you'd be like, what did you do? Not only was there this physical struggle, but the weight culturally, socially, spiritually, emotionally that could come with those who had these challenges was a very real thing. 
Set yourself in the sandals of these five men. Not only was there physical and financial difficulty for Matt, our, our paralyzed guy, but perhaps the weight of just being in a religious culture where you're constantly being looked down upon for reasons you don't know why could have been overwhelming. And they hear, there's a miracle worker in town. He touches lepers, casts out demons at his baptism. There was an audible voice from heaven. I mean, maybe Willie, Gus, Bobby, and Rufus said, Matt, let's get you there. And they finally get to the house. Can't get in the door. Can't even see the door. Look at what it says in verse 4. When they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now, this might sound crazy. They can't get in, so their first option, let's just rip the roof off, right? Is that most of our responses to things like concerts sold out? Rip the roof off. We can have, you know, balcony seating. Well, okay, no. See, here's the dynamic. You set yourself in the first century. Homes weren't large, and if the weather was permitting, their roofs could kind of, you know, kind of function as an outdoor living space. Think of it like a deck or a patio. You know, this is just an artistic rendering, but I'll show you a picture, like a cartoon almost, of maybe what this kind of home would have looked like. But it would suggest that this structure would have an outdoor stairway that led to this upper deck. So, so these four guys, right, Gus, Willie, Bobby, and Rufus, they grab Matt, they go up that outstairs staircase to this flat rooftop. And the roof would have been made of wood beams, maybe cross-laid with some branches, packed with a thick layer of grass and clay and mud, could easily walk on it and could probably even more easily dig right through it. And the language of the New Testament here says that they actually unroofed the roof probably wasn't a quiet, unnoticed thing in the middle of Jesus unpacking the truths of the Old Testament, right? People are probably dodging sticks, sneezing on dirt and debris, trying to get out of the way of pieces of clay as Gus, Willie, and Bobby and Rufus are lowering Matt on his mat to be front and center before Jesus. And I doubt that this was a flawless procedure. These four boys probably didn't have an LLC calling unroof with Rufus and the boys, right? This wasn't like a highly calculated, precise operation by Tom Cruise where they're just lowering him down. That's not what's happening here. Like Gus is probably shouting to Willie, lower your corner, we're going to lose Matt. Or Bobby to Rufus, your line's caught on a piece of clay again. And there's Matt on his mat dangling down before Jesus. And verse 5 tells us, Jesus, seeing their faith. You wonder what Jesus' facial expressions or demeanor was like. It's just everyone in the room as they're witnessing this. I mean, have you ever been in a Sunday morning Bible study, connect group, or some kind of, maybe you're giving a presentation and there's an interruption? In our day, it's not the roof coming off, though it may be later this summer because we're actually replacing all the roofs. So who knows? Maybe you'll experience something like this. But it's the cell phone, Right? It goes off, and it never fails. At least this happens for me and my wife, that when you hear a phone ringing, you're like, man, I can't believe that person won't turn that thing off. And then you sit there and realize, oh, that's actually my phone. And then as soon as you realize it's yours, it's like all sense of how to turn on and off of a phone just leaves you in that moment, right? I don't know if you've ever experienced that. But those kind of distractions. Well, Jesus is there in the midst of all this, and Jesus sees their faith. Whose faith? The Bible doesn't tell us specifically. I mean, Matt's got to have some kind of faith to be lowered down on a mat before Jesus. But the faith of these four guys, Gus, Willie, Bobby, and Rufus, the front door wasn't open. So they made a way for their friend to get to Jesus. Now, if we know each other, or we've been connected in some way, you may know that I have a, a challenge. I'm like an addicted alliterator. I just love when that stuff happens. So let me just share something with you real briefly about their faith. These four friends, they had a confident faith, a confident faith in Jesus, that if Jesus can just be there, if we can get our, our, our buddy Matt right in front of Jesus, I know that God will do something. Their faith was confident, but their faith was also compassionate. 
compassionate. They cared deeply about their friend. They had compassionate faith, confident faith, and their faith was creative, resourceful, even a little bit scrappy, right? Like they cared so much, had such confidence that creatively they thought, let's just rip the roof off to get Matt before Jesus, and their faith was contagious. Their faith affected Jesus and all those in the room. And as verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, probably something that they did not expect. Son, your sins are forgiven you. I love how Jesus speaks ever so endearingly to this man. He doesn't say, what are you boys doing? But he says, my child or my son, your sins are forgiven. What do you think those in the room were thinking about what Jesus said? Matt, our paralyzed man, possibly. He could have been under the weight of that first century mindset of the Jewish religion thinking, what's wrong with me? Why am I this way? Why am I paralyzed? Maybe, maybe these words came as a source of refreshment to him, possibly. The four friends, I don't know. Gus could have been on the top of the roof exhausted saying, Jesus, that's not why we're here. Like, <laughs> thank you for it, but he's paralyzed. The owner of the home could have been checking with Jesus' 12 disciples to see if they had incident insurance, you know, for the roof. Who knows? Who knows what's going on in the minds of every single person in the room? But we do know what's going on in the mind and heart of Jesus. He sees their faith, and immediately he speaks to the man's greatest need. Now, Admittedly, this can be a hard thing to swallow. But for this man, there were worse things in his life than not being in good health. Some would say his greatest need is spiritual. Have you seen him? Do you see all that these guys are doing to get this guy before Jesus? Let me share this with you. Sometimes we need to take God's word on faith because it is God's word. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Let's say you feel fine physically. Tip-top shape. Everything's okay. But you go in for a routine checkup, and the doctor spots something that you can't see and you definitely don't feel. You feel great. But the doctor says you really have something major going on. It's life-threatening, real problems in your body. See, in that moment, you need to believe the doctor no matter how you feel. And sometimes we may read the Bible, hear someone speak about sin, and in our temptation is to think comparatively. Well, my problems aren't that big of a deal. But the reality is we all need Jesus as a Savior because we're all under that same reality that we're prisoners that need to learn to run free. We're blind. And the only way we can be given sight is through what Jesus have to, has to offer through his forgiveness and his grace. This man's greatest need is our greatest need, forgiveness. Amen. And the crowd in the room must have been thinking, this is getting exciting. What's going to happen next? But the religious leaders, look at verse 6. Their thoughts... Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, hang with me. As you read through the Gospels, you constantly see Jesus at odds with the religious leaders, be it because of jealousy or perhaps fear. Remember, Rome is the dominant power at that time. If, if these religious leaders threw the weight of their support behind a king of the Jews, what would that mean for them? Or maybe it's because strictly they were just outwardly religious with hard-hearted disposition towards God and others. I don't know all the reasons. But there's something I want to point out here that I find interesting. These religious leaders actually do three things well but one thing that sours the three things that they did well. See, first and foremost, they were checking out Jesus of Nazareth. 
seeking to validate them. They're in Capernaum. They hear about this miracle worker. They've heard about the baptism. They're checking him out. Listen, in today's age, that's an okay, that's a good, that's a necessary thing to do. As things blow through the community of the church, go, okay, well, is what I'm seeing, is what I'm hearing, does it align with Scripture? You may know the story from Acts chapter 17, where Paul and Silas are in Berea. They're preaching, they're teaching, and as it says in verse 11 about those that are there, they searched the scriptures day after day to see if what Paul and Silas were teaching was the truth. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's encouraged in every single way. They're also reasoning in their hearts. It's not terribly wrong to reason about what you're hearing, to be an active listener. And they actually correctly analyzed the situation. They knew. Jesus, you're saying your sins are forgiven? Hey, listen, only God can do that. Only God can do that. And this is ever so true. When I sin against you, when you sin against another, you must understand that you're also sinning against God. And we need to have forgiveness from God. There's an important dimension of forgiveness that only God can deal with. Compensating good deeds do not forgive sin. I mean, all the times that you've maybe stopped appropriately at a red light or maybe didn't pull a U-turn on Highway 98 that no longer has medians. Have you seen people do that? Like when you hit traffic, you're like, I'm done with this. Just blow through a no median road. It's amazing to me. But, or obeyed the speed limit. None of that would mean anything to an officer who stopped you and tickets you for not doing one of those things one time. See, wishful thinking Good intentions, time, forgetfulness, success, we ourselves, these things do not absolve us of sin against God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is the only way possible to be made right in God's sight to confess our sins before him and to accept the forgiveness that he offers. So the scribes and the religious leaders, they're doing some things well, but here's what they did wrong. They didn't come with a heart that was open, but a predetermined disposition in their hearts. You've heard me maybe share this before. It's like those people that constantly do this. Sin sniffers, right? Now, everywhere, their they're, they're predetermined disposition is the negative. No, 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 this can't be right, and I'm going to prove it. A hard heart. And that predetermined prejudice against Jesus soured their hearts before any and everything that Jesus would teach or do. You've heard this before, the same water that can break a rock, you know, can also, or the same sun that can, you know, melt, you know that phrase, right? I don't know how that phrase goes. Melts the wax, hardens the clay. That's what's happening with these religious leaders. Their heart was not open. Nothing wrong with, with seeking to say, okay, here's Jesus. Does this align with scripture? Reasoning in their hearts. They knew what was being said, but their hearts were hard against the truth of the gospel, against the truth of who Jesus was. And that perspective poisoned them. Verse 8, so Jesus says, when he perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he says to them, why do you reason these things in your hearts? You think that would be like a, a light bulb going off in the religious leader's heart? This guy's determining what's going on in our hearts. Verse 9, he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or arise, take up your bed and walk? Interesting question. I mean, in one way, spiritually, you could say, well, it's easier to be healed than for sins to be forgiven. Look at all that Jesus had to do. But in the moment, what's Jesus's point? It's a much more difficult thing to heal the man who just came through the roof and see him stand up in the moment than to say something like your sins are forgiven. What do you mean by that? You know, by the grace of God, and good automotive engineering. I've been driving my 2002 Forerunner for years. It's a faithful ride. It's the ride my bride and I had the claws just married on. And it's also the ride that now my 14-year-old daughter is looking at, wondering what's going to happen to it in the next year or two as she gets a little bit older. But in any, in any vehicle, 
You know, there, there's light indicators that come on to tell you about something that's going on with your vehicle. But when your sins are forgiven, it's not like that we have like a little green notification light that just pings on our heads. Oh, there they are, all the forgiven ones, right? The forgiveness that Jesus offers is a very real thing, but not necessarily, especially in this moment, a physical thing that those scribes or those leaders could have validated on the spot. So Jesus is saying something here that fits with everything that Mark is saying throughout his gospel linguistically, seeking to startle, to jolt, to awaken those first century people and us to who Jesus is. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10, what he says. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Boy, the tension in that moment must have been thick. There's clay and grass and splinters of wood everywhere. The, the, the four friends are probably physically and emotionally tense. Religious leaders are wondering what's happening. The disciples, can you imagine? What if this doesn't work? But Jesus declares something. He identifies himself as the son of man. 81 times throughout the gospels, we see this phrase mentioned. Sometimes Jesus is using it to show himself as one who came to suffer. Others to show himself as one who's come in glory. Why? It's an Old Testament phrase. Psalm 144, when the term son of man is used, it's just describing a human being. Daniel chapter 7, it's describing the one who will come to establish God's kingdom. And this is who Jesus is. 100% man, 100% God. One author put it this way, Jesus avoided the term Christ or Messiah because he was a much more different kind of Messiah from what the Jewish nation anticipated in the first century. He came to suffer, and then he would come in glory. Claiming the title Son of Man allowed him to refer to the total scope of his messianic mission without all the political overtones. See, Jesus came as man and as God to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. In verse 12, we see the resolve of this entire scene. It says, immediately that man, our man Matt, arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all so that they were all amazed, glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. You know, I think it's a fair question to ask as we consider this account in Mark's gospel. Where am I in this story? Well, none of us are Jesus, right? Jesus has the authority to read our hearts, to heal sickness, to forgive sin. Jesus speaks and disease is gone. Demons run, death obeys. And sin is at the root of all disease, all maladies and death. And see, here's the thing. The gospel is trust in Jesus and your sins will be gone. And the root of suffering is severed. The good news of the kingdom is not that Jesus will heal all of your diseases now, but that he destroys the root of sin and death. Say, what do you mean by that? Cancer, tumors, Alzheimer's will not have the last word. Death has been defeated by the Son of Man, and he will have the last word. Amen. See, in an American context, we can kind of go, oh, yeah, everyone knows that. But that's not always the gospel that's preached all over the world. Some preach a gospel that says Jesus heals now. And if you're not experiencing that now, there's something going wrong on your end. But that, that's not the case. Jesus can heal and does heal now. As someone who works on staff here, we often are encountering dynamics where we're praying for people and we see some God fully, completely, miraculously heal. And then there's other times where we see Jesus take people home. And I love this perspective that Joni Erickson Tata shares about this. You may know who that is, a 17-year-old who experienced a, a spinal injury and spent the rest of her life in a wheelchair. 
Listen to what she says about this reality that Jesus severs the root of all suffering. She says this, I always say that in a way, I hope I can take my wheelchair to heaven with me. I know that's not biblically correct, but if I were able, I would have my wheelchair up in heaven right next to me when God gives me my brand new glorified body. And then I'll turn and say to Jesus, Lord, do you see that wheelchair right there? Well, you were right when you said that in this world we'll have trouble because that wheelchair has been a lot of trouble. But Jesus, the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. So thank you for what you did in my life through that wheelchair. And I love this part. And now I always say jokingly, you can send that wheelchair to hell if you want. (laughs) I love that. Because that's the truth of the gospel. That that the primary purpose of Jesus' life is so that he could die and rise again and give us new life. And this beautiful reality and promise that every paralytic man, everyone with Alzheimer's or tumors or cancer, they will not have the last word. The Son of Man will. That's who Jesus is. But as we close this morning, let me just ask you a couple questions. Where are you and I in this story? I mean, maybe you, if you're honest, you'd say where I am is I I kind of identify with the religious leaders. Like excessive skepticism about the Christian faith. It's okay to reason in your hearts. It's okay to seek to validate that who Jesus is and what he claim, who he claims to be. But perhaps your mindset is poisoned by preconceived prejudices. Here's the only thing I can say to that. The only thing I know to say that in all love. You need to repent of that and examine honestly who Jesus is who he claims to be, and realize that God is a God of love that sent his son. He's fully a God of justice and mercy. If you travel through the book of Revelation with us, you see how he balances and blends those those two truths perfectly. But I often recall that great reformer, Martin Luther, his story, that before he awakened to the truth of who God is in his grace, he was asked this question, because he was filled with such self-loathing, a distance from God, even to the point that history would tell us that he would subject his body to physical punishment because there was such a weight of sin upon him. And he was asked the question, Martin, what do you seek? And he says, I seek a God that I could love. Because see, for that man, he was under such condemnation from the enemy that he could not discern and realize that Romans 8.1 says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. When his heart was open to the truth of the word of God, an entire reformation took place in the life of the church, where the grace of God was embraced for who he truly is. See, if you're in those sandals this morning, I want to encourage you, let go of preconceived prejudices Don't demand that Jesus plays by your rules. Chapter 1, verse 1, he is the one to whom an evangelion is about. He's king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. We don't have him play by our rules. We play by his. Maybe you're the friends, right? I don't know. Maybe there's someone in your life, a family member or a friend, who you've constantly been trying to bring to Jesus. Let me just say this. Don't let go of that rope until the Lord answers. Hang in there and bringing someone to Jesus. Right? These these friends, they had a confident faith. If we can just get them to Jesus. There's a compassionate faith. There was a creative faith. It was scrappy, right? Rip the roof off. There was a faith that was contagious. Hang in there. Do not grow weary while doing good. Jesus can do more in a moment than we could ever do in a lifetime of trying to bring someone. Trust, trust, and just keep bringing your friends to Jesus. You know, hopefully this is not a crowd that you identify with, but the Capernaum crowd is an interesting crowd. If you read through the gospel accounts, with Capernaum being this home base of Jesus' ministry, let me share with you some of the things that Jesus did in this town. Obviously, he healed the paralytic like we read today. 
He also healed the centurion's son, found in the, the Gospel of Matthew. Peter's mother-in-law was healed before this crowd. He cleansed the man with an unclean spirit. He healed the woman who had that issue of blood for 12 years there. He raised Jairus' daughter, who was a 12-year-old who had died. Those in the city of Capernaum witnessed many miracles of Jesus. That story that's told of where Peter caught a fish and the coin was in his mouth to pay for taxes, that happened in Capernaum. It was in the synagogue of Capernaum where Jesus gave that amazing message about he being the bread of life. But some of the final words Jesus had to Capernaum are found in Matthew chapter 11, where he says, you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did for you had been done in the wicked Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom would be better off on judgment day than you. Why do I share that? You've heard many others say this before. Jesus is not looking for fans. He's looking for followers. And the crowd were those that were like, man, what's, what's Jesus going to do? They're a bystander. They're just kind of, they applaud Jesus. They don't have anything negative to say about Jesus, but he's not Lord of their life. Jesus did all these miracles in front of these individuals, but still they acted like fans, not followers. Or maybe you can identify with Matt our paralyzed guy. You may not even feel this, but your greatest problem is actually a sin problem. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus, but the Spirit of God is speaking to you, to your heart, inviting you to respond, to come to Jesus. See, this morning, in just a moment, we'll close in a time of song, and we'll have prayer team members up here and I firmly believe that many of us, if not all of us, can find ourselves in one of these camps where we identify with Gus, Willie, Bobby, and Rufus, right? We're the friends seeking to bring people to Jesus. I'd encourage you to come to the prayer team and pray on behalf of your mat in your life. Maybe you're far from God, didn't even sense this need that you knew that you needed to be forgiven by God because of your sin. Come and receive prayer. Surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe you find yourself, I don't know, a little salty, a little hard-hearted. Come and be prayed for. You don't want to end up like Capernaum or those religious leaders where the work of God is happening before your life, but you're so far from God that it seems to have little to no impact. You know, in the book of Acts, it says, if you'll repent, there's times of refreshing that will come from the Lord.